Okay, everyone, let's get started. Um, so today we're going to focus on multilingual NLP. Um, there's a recent model that uh, came out called uh, Bactrian X, um, which, uh, sorry, where's the thing I wanted to show? Um, which is a multilingual instruction tuned language model. So it's the first. Uh, of its kind. Uh, I, I mean, GPT-4 and ChatGPT also exhibit multilingual capabilities, but this model is uh, specifically trained on many different languages uh, with I instructions. So um, we're probably going to be seeing more and more multilingual large language models like this one, which uh, have similar capabilities to uh, models like ChatGPT. Um, so before we get started, some uh, logistics stuff. So all of your assignments at this point for the rest of the semester are now released. So the main one, obviously, is the final project report um, that is due on May 17th. So um, you all should be working on that. Um, other than that, you have a quiz um, that is left and the, the homework. So. Um, and if you would like to do the extra credits, uh, those are uh, obviously, oh, I guess I forgot to um, uh, advertise the extra credit talk tomorrow. It's at the same time, um, 1130 to 1230. Uh, I'll post on Piazza after the class if you would like to attend via Zoom. Um, I think it might be recorded, but not sure about that yet. Um, okay, and the other thing, of course, you all probably saw the Piazza post on the rampant cheating that is going on in the exam. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's kind of shocking that, uh, like, I don't know, a third of the class would congregate in one location to take the exam. Um, we've already penalized quite a few people, which I already thought was a lot, but um, yeah, clearly there's a lot more. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the penalties have not been officially recorded yet. Uh, today was the last day for the people that we notified last week to uh, admit in writing that they cheated to get the, the penalty that we stated. Um, so, so far, almost all of them have admitted to it. Um, that said, uh, you know, it's really unfair to most of the people who did the exam honestly to have people whose grades might have been inflated due to this, uh, this cheating, although from what we can tell, none of these students did particularly well on the exam. But still, like, uh, it's, and also for the students who were caught cheating, it must feel pretty bad to have you know, someone who is sitting next to you not uh, getting the same harsh penalty. So uh, if you have any information on this, please send it. Um, I mean, from my perspective, it would be good to catch as many people as we could, but um, I'm also not going to, you know, um, do a law and order style investigation here. Because, I mean, one thing we could do is like, uh, we were just joking amongst the, the TAs and I, like this all happened in some apartment complex. We could look at the like cameras on the buses going to the <laughs> apartment complex and identify all the people. Um, that's, uh, I mean, maybe the honesty board would do something like that, but, but I'm not going to do that. So, um, yeah, I, I would say to those of you who did cheat and weren't caught that it is very likely that we will uh, find you from either someone, um, you know, giving us a list of names of people who, who were at the gathering. Uh, we already have flagged several other exams that are very suspicious uh, that... Uh, might have just been one or two problems, so we didn't um, notify you. But we're probably going to go back and look at all those exams more closely now that we know that there's, you know, a huge uh, number of students who we have not yet um, caught. So anyway, uh, that's that. Um, any questions uh, on stuff for the rest of the semester? Yeah. No, I, I wanted there to be five quizzes, so it would be like evenly split up. But um, yeah, I, I was not organized enough to make that happen. So there will only be four quizzes. Um, and the total weight of the quiz will just be evenly divided into four. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I think it's tomorrow at 11.59 p.m. So we still have a lot of regrade requests that we haven't yet gone through, um, but we will do that. Tomorrow is the last day to request uh, one, however. And um, yeah, some of you have been coming to our office hours to discuss, uh, but we would recommend you just uh, do the discussion via grade scope and only come to our office hours if you're legitimately curious or uh, not to argue the, <laughs> the point, basically. All right, anyone else? See you on YouTube. OK, will be recorded. So the extra credit talk uh, tomorrow will be recorded. OK, so let's get started. I just wanted to start this lecture by talking about this uh, model that was released, um, I think, last week. So it's obviously very new. Um, we had talked uh, previously in the semester about the alpaca model um, that was released by Stanford, where they essentially just prompted um, GPT-3 to generate a bunch of um, tasks with instructions and outputs. And then they fine-tuned the llama model on um, the output of GPT-3 and got a pretty good instruction-following model. So essentially, this was one example of kind of extracting or stealing um, GPT-3, distilling it into a much smaller um, model that retains a lot of the performance. So Stanford actually released the data set that they created from prompting GPT-3. So it's available for anyone to look at. Uh, I think it's on Hugging Face, so you can check it out. Um, but that data set was only created in English. So all of the tasks there were written in English. Um, and so as a result, the alpaca model works primarily for English. It might do something in other languages, but it did not receive instructions in any other language. So this uh, work does, I think, a very simple, straightforward first step towards um, enabling multilingual instruction following with a small model like uh, the 7 billion parameter llama. Uh, so what they do is they take the data set created from uh, Alpaca and they use Google Translate to translate those instructions and the outputs of the instructions to uh, 51 different languages. So obviously this is not the best uh, way to get uh, tasks and instructions in different languages. Google Translate makes a ton of errors, as uh, Marjana probably alluded to in the last lecture. Uh, but still, like maybe we can tolerate some amount of noise in this kind of data when we are fine-tuning our models. So now we have these translated instructions. So they only translate the instructions of the tasks. And they get responses to those uh, instructions from GPT 3.5. So here, you're also assuming that GPT 3.5 can um, generate fluent, coherent, and relevant text to those instructions. They didn't want to translate the outputs to the instructions because that might have been too noisy just doing that through Google Translate. So in total, they have 3.5 million, um, sorry, let me zoom in here. 3.5 million instructions and responses in 52 different languages. So 51 and then English was the original language of the data set. Now they take the llama model that we talked about. Meta released this. Uh, it was trained for a trillion tokens or something like that, 1.4 trillion tokens, um, following the chinchilla scaling laws. Uh, they released a 7 billion, 30 billion, and like 65 billion parameter language model uh, in this work. And what is very popular in other open source models is you take the 7 billion parameter llama model, which is the, the smallest one, and you um, adapt it to some data set using a parameter efficient fine tuning method. So, we've talked about so far fine tuning as uh, one approach to adapt a pre-trained language model to a new task. So for example, instruction tuning is doing fine tuning of the full model on your data set of instructions and um, outputs. So uh, this work uses a method that we haven't yet talked about in the class, which we will talk about uh, towards the end, which is called LoRa. Uh, it's a low rank um, adaptation of pre-trained language models. So we also talked about prompt tuning, remember, as another more efficient way of adapting a language model to a downstream task, where you just add these uh, new embeddings at the beginning of the input, and you only backprop into those embeddings. 
Uh, LoRa is a little different in that it tries to approximate the uh, gradient updates to several parameters in the language model, but do it in a low rank way so that you don't add a lot of new parameters to the model. Uh, so we'll talk about that uh, a bit later, but for now all you need to know is they uh, basically fine-tuned their uh, LAMA model on this data set of 52 different languages where you have this instruction and uh, task demonstrations um, for these uh, different languages. And they released their language model. Uh, so I think they released their model without even putting out a paper, so they're probably working on the paper right now. Uh, interestingly, they're still in the process of training this model. So this has been a more common way of releasing things uh, recently is that um, people will release checkpoints from a much longer training run. So these uh, people will release like another checkpoint next week when their model is trained on more tokens and, and go from there. So uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I think the these early checkpoints will still be quite useful, um, which is why they're, they're doing this. Um, but yeah, this is probably a good first step towards a more um, multilingual language model with some of the capabilities of GPT-4. Yeah? Even though it's still in the training phase, do you still have to support that point of data? Yeah, so... Yeah, so the idea is that it is... It, they're only releasing it because it is useful at the current point. They expect it to get better, but that's also an unknown. At some point, it might plateau. Um, finally, I want to emphasize that GPT-4 and ChatGPT are very good multilingual language models for several languages. Like They can already do instruction following and ver solve very complex tasks and, and uh, as you saw last lecture, translate uh, documents as well. Um, one issue, of course, is that these models are closed source. We have no idea what data they were trained on, what the composition of their pre-training or uh, RLHF for instruction tuning data is, and uh, many other details. We can't inspect the model's parameters. Um, and so these are, uh, this, this here is one example of a larger effort to open source these large language models. So anyone can download this model and do it, do whatever they want uh, to the parameters. They can fine tune it, they can probe it, they can do all these things that you can't effectively do with um, GPT-4. So if you're interested in the state of the art for different languages, it you know, you're probably going to be using GPT-4, but uh, I think this is one, like, view towards the future where we won't be, you know, beholden to just some closed source uh, language model that we, we have no details on how big it is or what it was trained on, so. Did you uh, see that, it's slightly off topic, did you see that in the paper from Google about how, like, they think that open source models will overtake the closed source ones eventually? But, like, it seems like all these, are using GPT to train. So like, I'm thinking, like, what is their reasoning of why it would overtake those models even though it's using them to train? Yeah, so first, uh, you were referring to this leaked document. We, we don't know how valid this document is, but uh, purportedly from some Google employee who was disgruntled and wanted to write a paper on why uh, he believes that Google and OpenAI, their competition is not really each other, but these kinds of open source language models because, you know, there's increasing efforts to, there's so many of these fine-tuned llama models that have been released. Um, I agree with you that these kinds of efforts do depend heavily on some large teacher model like uh, GPT-3 or GPT-4. I think the general idea is that at some point there will be some techniques developed to allow training from scratch of a similar scale model and also enough data to be able to replicate these efforts. So right now, um, you know, OpenAI doesn't have to automatically generate these responses because they've already collected human data on what tasks uh, people care about and what kind of in instructions they're feeding in. And they've hired people to you know, write out the actual uh, acceptable outputs for a particular task, right? The problem is they haven't released that data. So all of these efforts are trying to simulate it by uh, essentially extracting it from the model itself. Um, 
But there have been many efforts to collect an uh, open source data set like this. And although they're not at the same scale yet, they probably will be at some point. Um, Stanford had a large data set of uh, like human feedback that they released, uh, or sorry, like preference judgments on um, text released. And Anthropic open sourced their uh, data set of human feedback as well. So we'll probably see uh, you know, similar kinds of data releases that enable the scaling of these models in open source setting. But um, yeah, it, it, who knows how long that will take. I do think the point in that leaked document is um, fairly valid, though it's not clear for the companies how long the current state of affairs can last where they're the only ones that have this capability and they will share as much of it as they like, but not uh, everything. Um, so yeah, maybe you could post that on Piazza for everyone else to read uh, when you get a chance. Other questions? Yeah. Ah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure. Uh, so I imagine that their data set includes the original Alpaca data set. Uh, you can see that it includes 52 uh, responses here. Uh, sorry, 52 different languages. So uh, I assume they included the original Alpaca uh, data set, which would mean that the two are probably comparable. Um, so. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. They, they could have done it in a staged way where they first fine tune on Alpaca and then fine tune on this noisier data set. Um, and maybe they will try that at some point. I, I'm not sure. It's a good question. All right. So um, what I want to do now is take a little bit of a step back and talk about some um, tasks that are of interest in multilingual natural language processing, talk about some of the challenges that these models can face when being applied to solve a task like question answering on a different language. Um, and then uh, towards the end, I'll talk about this uh, LoRa adaptation strategy, which is uh, definitely the one that we see being used most commonly now. It's very easy to apply, and it's, it's memory efficient. Um, and uh, some of the arguments in the paper, which was assigned uh, yesterday, sorry, as reading today, <laughs> um, is uh, some of the interesting points are uh, compared to full model fine tuning, it's much more, um, it's much cheaper. So you can, um, you, you get a lot of memory savings and uh, it's generally the weights that you store are smaller than the full weights of the model. So you don't have to make a copy of the entire model and fine tune that. Um, we also talked about prompt tuning. So they argue in their paper that LoRa is more robust than um, prompt tuning, that it doesn't have the same issues with like the initialization mattering a lot and a lot of instability and high variance that, that we do see with prompt tuning for smaller models. So um, it's clearly caught on in the community. All of the open source instruction following models are uh, generally tuned using LoRa. Yeah, Alpaca was, this new model was, and several others that you might have seen all use this method. Um, and uh, it's definitely something to be aware of as you, uh, if you're interested in you know, adapting your own language models to various tasks. All right, so let's get started then uh, with these slides. Um, so uh, this um, Bactrian and X model is one instance of transfer. So here you have uh, data that is uh, in English originally. And you want a model that is capable of executing these instructions in many different languages, not just English. So um, you know, in the last class, you, you focused specifically on machine translation. But machine translation is not the only multilingual natural language processing task. Any task you can do in English, you can, you can do in a different language, right? So how do we adapt a general purpose language model to solve tasks in different languages? So uh, you see a very common approach in the uh, prior literature where people take a model that has been shown to work well for English and try and replicate the same procedure for a different language. So when BERT came out, um, there were a lot of attempts to 
replicate BERT, except switch the pre-training data to a different language. So there was like a Dutch version of BERT, a French version, a Vietnamese version. Each of these uh, required whoever was creating this model to train it from scratch on a monolingual like Vietnamese or French data set. So they had to find, you know, like a billion tokens or something like that and uh, train their BERT-like model from scratch. So this has some advantages, like your tokenizer can be fully specialized to that language um, and, uh, you know, maybe it'll be able to learn uh, things that it might not learn if you're mashing like a hundred languages into, a, into one data set, like uh, we'll talk about a bit later. But it's not very general purpose, right? So I can only use my Vietnamese BERT model for Vietnamese text. I can't use it for any other language. If I wanted to perform a ta task in both Dutch and Vietnamese, I would need two separate models for that, right? And so if I'm considering serving some task to uh, the entire world, right, depending on what language they speak, I might need to have like 100 different models or 200 different models. Um, also, what happens if I can't collect a large number of uh, training instances in a particular language, right? Some languages just don't have that much digitized text available on the internet, uh, so I can't really train a model like BERT, let alone a model like GPT-4, where uh, you know it's very unclear what other language than English you can get such a huge amount of training data for. Like if you think about the chinchilla scaling laws, it says if you want like, you know, a, a 70 billion parameter model, you need like 3 trillion tokens or, or whatever was in the uh, scaling laws, right? So, um, you know, where are you going to get that uh, amount of data for some lower resource language? That, that's just not uh, feasible. So the other approach is to train a single model on a mixture of many different languages. And this we see more commonly nowadays, right? So in the BERT days, we saw it with the multilingual BERT and uh, you know, multilingual BART, XLM, MT5, and ByteT5 we talked about before. All of these models are trained on the concatenation of text from many different languages. So you have a single tokenizer that is used for all of these different languages. Um, and uh, the pre-training objective is the same for all of the languages. So you get one model, and the hope is that you can use it for any language that was included in the pre-training data set. So uh, this has another advantage compared to the monolingual paradigm that we just discussed. Um, specifically, it allows me to, let's say I see an instance of a task in English but I don't observe that same task in my Vietnamese training data. If I have one model that's trained on both English and Vietnamese, there could be some transfer by which the model learns how to perform the task in Vietnamese even though it only saw it in English, right? That's not possible if you train on just Vietnamese where that task was never present in the first place. So this is like the intuition behind why people prefer these single model multi-language um, uh, uh, instances. So what kind of data set do you train such a model on, like a mixture of different languages? The most common one is MC4, which is the multilingual common crawl data set. It's been heavily filtered and deduplicated, and also people generally have different um, sampling configurations for different languages. So some languages might be downsampled, like English. Uh, I, you probably can't see this, but English is the most uh, frequently occurring um, language in the common crawl, in, at least in this data set. Next we have Russian, Spanish, German, French, Italian, Portuguese, Polish, Dutch, and so on. Um, but the languages down here, they occur like multiple orders of magnitude uh, less than um, a language like English or Russian. So if you're training a model on just this entire data set, you're probably not going to learn very much from these uh, languages down here, right? Because you barely ever see them during training, which is why you probably want to change the mixture of this data set. So maybe for the languages down here, you can upsample how many times you observe them during a training batch. 
while a language like English, you might want to downsample. So again, um, GPT-4 and uh, ChatGPT are trained on a mixture of uh, different languages. Um, the exact proportions of those uh, languages we don't yet know. Uh, they might have used the multilingual common crawl, but they also probably used uh, copyrighted books in all of those languages as well. So you can see that some of these um, models down here, like they support over a hundred different languages and um, Meta in particular has uh, been very active in the uh, development of models that can um, kind of expand these hundred languages to um, many more low resource languages. So um, they, they had, they at least had at some point a project um, that was aiming to make these kinds of multilingual language models accessible to uh, readers of all sorts of uh, low, low resource languages, not just the top hundred that uh, all have Wikipedias associated with them. So Wikipedia is a very common data source for uh, just acquiring a lot of unlabeled text. Okay. So um, let's kind of formalize the, the thing that I was talking about before with these kind of mixture uh, models. Um, so in particular, there's an area for it centered around cross-lingual zero-shot learning. So this is the case where, let's say I want to solve sentiment analysis. And I have a huge sentiment data set in English, but I do not have a sentiment data set in, say, Portuguese. So um, my goal is to take my multilingual language model, which has seen during pre-training both English and Portuguese, um, and I'm going to fine tune it on my English sentiment data set. So now, uh, at test time, what if I give this model a Portuguese sentence and ask it to predict the sentiment? How well can it do that? So this is the zero-shot transfer case because the model has not seen any examples in Portuguese of sentiment analysis, right? Uh, it's only seen unlabeled data in Portuguese. It's seen labeled data in English. So the transfer part is can you transfer the sentiment um, knowledge that the model has learned to a different language? So a big challenge here is the problem of when you fine-tune on English, you might make the model forget its ability to produce text in any other language, right? So if I fine tune this multilingual language model that knows both English and Portuguese, uh, if I fine tune it on just English, so it sees multiple epochs of English data coming in, it might learn how to, it, it might specialize very well to the English data and forget how to process Portuguese. And this happens um, quite a lot to, to varying degrees. So it's the most important challenge when we're talking about transfer. Um, how do you prevent the model from forgetting its knowledge of uh, pre-trained, uh, uh, of different languages during pre-training? So there's a, a many data sets that have been created to evaluate cross-lingual zero-shot transfer. Uh, XNLI is one um, popular data set. So this is an entailment data set. Here, you're given two pairs of, uh, you're given two sentences, and you're asked, what is the relationship between one sentence to the, to the other one? Do these two sentences, does the first one entail the second one? Does it contradict the second one? Or are they neutral? So here, you see an example in English. You don't have to stay here as the first sentence. You can leave as the second sentence. And this is a three-way classification problem. So the model has to decide, does the first sentence, is it entailed by the second sentence? Does it contradict the second sentence? Or is it neutral? Um, and you have this uh, data in um, seven different languages. Um, so uh, you can test, for example, uh, given a multilingual language model, you can fine tune it only on English entailment, and then a test time tested on French. Uh, entailment examples to see if it can transfer to French, despite being fine-tuned only on English examples of this task. So let's see what the performance is of different multilingual language models on this benchmark when you give it just English training data. So you give it only the first row of this table, and you evaluate on the full test set of every different language combined. Um, so here you see 
Uh, just look at this first column. This is the XNLI um, performance. Multilingual BERT gets an accuracy about, of about 65% on this three-way classification problem averaged over all uh, languages. Um, and you can see that MT5XXL is significantly better than this. So MT5XXL is a much larger model than BERT. Um, it's been pre-trained on much more data. It actually was pre-trained on this MC4 data set that we just talked about. Um, and you can see that this pre-training boosted dramatically its uh, cross-lingual transferability. So its ability to perform this task on many different languages despite just seeing English training examples. So um, this is all without any sort of augmentation or anything like that. We saw in the Backtree and X uh, paper that, uh, sorry, not paper, uh, GitHub repository, that uh, one way to get more data in different languages is to use a machine translation system, right? So one thing I could do is I take the English data that I have and I can use Google Translate or something else to translate that data into French, Spanish, German, Swahili, Russian, and Chinese. So every sentence in this English data set, I'll have translations into all of these different languages. And now I can just train my model on all of these uh, instances, not just the English ones. I can also train on the French translations and the German translations and whatever. Um, so how much benefit does that give me? Because now I'm fine tuning not just on English, but also on translated text from different languages. So in um, the MT5 paper, they find that adding these extra translation, the translated data doesn't give you much benefit over just uh, fine tuning on the English data alone. So in particular, if you look at MT5 XXL, it got 85% without these translations and 87.8% with uh, translations. So um, there is an improvement, right? But it's not huge. It's not like as large as you might have expected it to be. And this is true even with the smaller models. So MT5 small um, is a very uh, tiny model. It gets 67% on this data set when you fine tune it just on English. It actually does worse. It gets 64% when you fine tune it on all of these translated examples. So why do you think this is? Why isn't translation helping uh, a lot? Okay, yeah, so I, I think what you're saying is that the translation itself might be flawed in many ways, right? It could be introducing noise that is preventing the model actually from, like maybe actually the model had a better understanding of Swahili during pre-training, and now when you presented with all these translations from, say, Google Translate that are riddled with artifacts, it forgets all that knowledge that it, it learned in the first place. It's very plausible. Uh, are there any other... Um, I think it's because as long as it's going to be trained on the multilingual content, it has to understand the only multilingual like retention as well. So that um, so without understanding all the translated content, it really can finish some of the certifications correctly. But like um, that's probably the reason. It's like the original um, version of the model can already handle some cases, so like the translated content will just finish like those um, fixing those edge cases. Uh huh. And I suppose if the translation is itself noisy, maybe it doesn't fix that many cases at all. Okay. Yeah, that's plausible. Any other ideas? Yeah. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. So if we have a much bigger fine-tuning corpus, then maybe if we're doing the same same number of iterations over this, we risk more forgetting of the pre-trained uh, knowledge. That's also true. Um, another uh, reason potentially could be that you're not actually adding any new semantic content when you're doing the translation, right? You still have the same set of English examples. Um, they're just translated. So it's not the same as having like unique French uh, examples or unique Spanish examples that are different from the, the English ones. So maybe since you're not adding any new content, 
the model is not learning um, you know, different properties of the task itself, but rather is just learning properties of the language. But yeah, that's unclear. Yeah. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just saying that the way the data is created, you, let's say you have, uh, you know, a thousand English sentence pairs here. So I would translate each of the sentences in that data set to French, but I'm not uh, creating any new sentences this way, right? They, they have the same semantic content as the English sentences. So this could be a little different than, let's say I had a thousand unique um, sentence pairs in French that were distinct from the, the English sentences. So uh, here I'm not seeing any new semantic content. I'm just seeing different views of the same sentences in different languages. So that, that could be another uh, reason as well. So like getting too used to this type of semantic. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, um, I wanted to switch next to another benchmark task that people use to study these kinds of cross-lingual uh, models, which is uh, tie-dye QA. So this is essentially a squad-like data set where the answer passages and the questions come from many different languages. Uh, and these are linguistically diverse languages. Um, so in particular, they look at English, Arabic, Bengali, Finnish, Indonesian, Japanese, Kiswahili, I guess that's, I'm not sure what that is, Korean, Russian, Telugu, and Thai. Um, and you can see that they actually went through the effort of making this nice table explaining to us how these languages differ from each other in, in critical properties. So for example, many of the languages don't use the Latin script that we're familiar with in English. Um, some of them don't use white space tokens to separate words. Some of them, actually one of them, doesn't have um, markable sentence boundaries. Uh, the word formation is more complex in many of these languages than in others. Um, some have gender explicitly encoded, uh, others don't. Uh, some, actually many of them, drop pronouns. Um, uh, and, and, you know, English does not. Um, so anyway, they're very uh, different from each other. So you can see in this table alone some examples of how this kind of multilingual model has to deal with a wide range of phenomena depending on the language that it's processing. Some of them might be completely the opposites of each other in, in how they handle these different phenomena. Um, so I wanted to quickly show the web page here because it has some interesting examples from the data set. So uh, first of all, just to clarify, this data set has many settings, but uh, I guess we can actually take a look at the image down here. Um, so we'll have to wait until it restarts. So basically, you have a question of like, uh, you know, how is beer made or something? And so the first task is to identify a paragraph that contains the answer. And so this they call the long answer. Next, you have to identify a span within that passage that actually answers the question. So uh, the second task is very similar to squad, right? Uh, where you're just trying to find the beginning and end of the answer span within the passage. So um, they have all these uh, interesting examples from the data set that show the challenge of this task in different languages. Um, so for example, here they have spelling variation when you're transliterating from, from a language of, of like an entity. So Mozart here, um, this is a non-native name, right, in Arabic. Um, it's spelled like this in the question, but it's actually spelled like this in the answer passage. So if I were just control Fing for this spelling, I wouldn't be able to find the corresponding instance of Mozart in the, the Wikipedia article to, to answer this question. Um, so both of the spellings are correct, and they are referring to Mozart. It's just that there is some variation in spelling in this language. Um, you also see for uh, many languages script switching. So Russian is, it uses the Cyrillic script, but sometimes it can use the uh, Latin spelling of certain words. So here you have this means telephone uh, in Russian, but it can also be spelled like this. Um, and so if the question contains this, this form of telephone, but the answer, uh, I guess this is even another form where it's just uh, 
written as, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure where it's written actually, but uh, it's clearly not in the same form as the original uh, question. And so here um, you have to actually match across different scripts to find the correct answer, which can be very complex and confusing to a model. So there are many other examples. Uh, there's stuff with word boundaries, uh, gender variation, morphological inflection, um, and you know these are things that we might not uh, really be aware of it because they don't happen so frequently in English, but they're very common in many other languages. Uh, so here we see, um, all right, what do we see here? Okay, this has too much text for me to just read right now. So um, anyway, you can check out this uh, web page if you want to see more examples. Yeah, do you have a question? So like, not a Russian example, like theoretically in the Russian Wikipedia, if this is a common thing to do, then like that would show up a lot in the data set, right? Like where they're using borrowed words. Yeah. So maybe the model would be able to learn like that. Yeah, I, I think the model can learn this, certainly. It's just that it's you know, one layer up of complexity compared to if the scripts were the same, right? Now it has to learn how to match things in two different scripts, which, which could be challenging, um, depending on how much data like this it sees. Yeah, but uh, I'm not saying it's hard. Uh, I'm just saying, like, you know, it is some complexity that is not really present in English-only data sets. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, that definitely affects the performance of these models on different languages. Um, so yeah, I, I uh, I'm not sure exactly to what effect that has, but uh, certainly it's something to be. It's another property of the language that needs to be taken into account. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, the tokenization is a very interesting problem. Uh, generally, none of these uh, models makes any effort to intelligently handle the tokenization properly such that, you know, all of the subwords in one language make sense and you're not just splitting a word randomly because uh, some subword also occurred frequently in another language. Um, in general, what happens is you take a data set like MC4, you concatenate it together, and then you estimate your um, byte pair encoding uh, tokenization on it using some library like sentence piece or word piece or whatever. So if you remember from that lecture, we're basically just looking at the most frequently occurring characters that occur uh, and merging them together and then redoing this. Uh, so you can see that this process is uh, going to treat um, languages that are lower down here um, more bizarrely than they would treat uh, higher resource languages because you can imagine if there are any overlapping words or subwords between English and one of the languages down here, um, the English tokenization will be prioritized. So if that subword ever occurs in a different language, it will probably be tokenized as a separate word, even if it doesn't make sense to do so in that language. Uh, this is a big problem. Um, it's not clear to what extent it affects the performance of these different tasks, but um, yeah, I mean, it's hard to see what an alternative could be. Like maybe you could do language identification first and then um, use a language specific tokenizer afterwards. But, you know, that risks uh, maybe you won't train certain embeddings as much as others. I'm not really sure what the right answer is, but um, yeah, it's, it's a problem. So generally what people do is they will upsample some languages even when they estimate the vocabulary, like the byte pair encoding vocabulary, but uh, even finding the optimal weights is, is, is hard. So yeah, it's a great question. Just curious if the model was Yeah. Sure. 
Yeah, so um, I, I, so there actually are some data sets that will uh, I dis distinguish between different types of English. Uh, so there's British English, um, there's you know American English in the 1800s or the 1700s versus now is very different, right? So um, you do see that. I think in the common crawl, these are all categorized as English, so you don't really see that variation here. But um, there are other data sets like for style transfer and things where um, those distinctions are made, but um, not, not here. But that said, the model, if it sees British English and American English, and it sees clear markers of British English being used in a piece of text, uh, it will likely learn that if there's enough of it in its pre-training data. So was this the MT5 model? That does not do like by level tokenization, right? Uh, no, that one uses subword tokenization and so sentence MT5 piece. Yeah, so byte T5 is actually trained using this data set as well. Um, so yeah, byte T5, as we discussed, uh, does get around some of these limitations with tokenization in that its vocabulary is super small, right? It's 256 bytes, so uh, you, you don't really have much opportunity to uh, overfit to a particular language. But on the other hand, uh, since the sequences are much longer, the model itself will probably overfit to certain byte sequences that occur very frequently in a certain language. So the problem is, is very difficult to solve in general. Okay, so um, maybe let's go back to where we were. Yeah, so uh, nothing uh, too surprising here and should not be surprising given what we've talked about this semester. A bigger model is better, um, the sad truth of uh, natural language processing. Uh, you can see here on tie-dye QA that MT5, the largest uh, 13 billion parameter model, gets about 80% F1. Um, and you can see that the small model is really terrible at this task. It gets only 35%. So it is showing that in order to do this uh, question answering over all of these different languages, you really benefit from a large model that's trained on this MC4 data set. Okay, so one thing that a lot of your questions have gotten towards is, um, you know, what happens to languages that are not uh, as well represented in the pre-training data set? Um, this has been looked at before. Uh, there was a paper, I think, from Meta a couple years ago that um, offered this phrase, the curse of multilinguality. So for a fixed size model, the per language capacity decreases as we increase the number of languages. So this is basically saying that if we have a model that, say, has a billion parameters and we train it just on English, um, and let's say we train it on a billion tokens of English, and then we have a different configuration where we have the same model, but we pre-train it on one billion English per, uh, data set, one billion English tokens and one billion French tokens, um, the first model will do better on English language tasks than the second model. And this extends to the case where, let's say you have the same one billion parameter model and you train it on one billion tokens of English, one billion of French, and one billion each of like 50 different languages. The resulting model is going to be worse on all languages than like the corresponding monolingual model that's trained only on that language. Um, so you can see here, uh, this is the same model. It's been trained on uh, many different languages uh, in this plot. Um, I'm not sure what task. I think it might be XNLI that this accuracy is uh, shown. So the blue bar is a low resource language, the average performance on languages that they marked as low resource. The orange bar is high resource, and the gray bar is all. So let's just take a look at the gray bar. Uh, you can see that for the same model, it's trained on seven languages. The performance is around 75%. Uh, if you train it on 100 languages, it drops to 60-something um, percent. Um, so you can see that the high resource performance is dropping. The low resource performance is also dropping. So you can't just blindly scale up the data without also scaling up the model. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm not sure about that. Um, 
Yeah, <laughs> not going to speculate either. So, like, while there is a decrease, like, the difference is not that big. Like, do you think that there's a lot of variability in these experiments that, like, if someone did this again, we would see the same thing? Because I, I think it's a good question. I, I don't doubt that these results are, um, you know, correct, but. What I would say is it depends a lot on the benchmark. So it would be interesting to see these numbers with like tie-dye QA or with some other way more complex task, right? It's just, you know, the nice thing about the benchmarks is that it's easy to evaluate, right? Here I can just look at accuracy on a three-way classification task versus if I want to look at something more interesting like some uh, generative QA or translation, uh, the evaluation is not trivial, so it's harder to run these kind of large-scale experiments and have a way of measuring their quality accurately. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't doubt this phenomenon, but it could be just for classification tasks. It could just be for this particular classification task. Um, but that said, people have observed the same phenomenon across a range of different tasks since this paper was published. So that suggests that there is something to the. Uh, so you've the definitely point. seen in other papers where models like they'll change something and it'll get a lot worse than one thing, but it's still great. Like all the yeah, metrics. yeah. It, I mean, you're only evaluating one very specific capability of the model here. So um, yeah, it's a good point that you shouldn't generalize to. Um, and who knows if, like, you know, GPT-4 behaves like this as well, right? It's completely unclear. But, um, yeah, it's a good question. Any other questions? All right. So um, there's also many different use cases of multilingual language models. Like, for example, let's say that you are only interested in solving a particular task on one language. So you don't actually care then if the performance on other languages goes down. This is true of many consumers of multilingual language models. They only care about one language and they don't really want to use it on any other language. So this means in this setting you might be best off by just fine tuning the model fully on the data from your target language. Even if it forgets all the other uh, languages, it still might be best for your particular use case. Um, so in that case, you're done and you might be happy with the result. But it's more interesting when you actually don't want the performance on other languages to go down, right? So this is this transfer setting that we're talking about. And so full fine tuning of the model does result in this forgetting of the pre-trained knowledge of all of these languages. So one hypothesis is that if you use a strategy that does not fine tune all of the parameters, but maybe keeps most of the parameters frozen of the pre-trained model and just only adapts a small number of them, then maybe the resulting model will be less likely to uh, forget how to generate text in those other languages. So there have been numerous methods proposed to do this kind of more parameter efficient um, fine tuning. Uh, for multilingual cases especially, there's uh, a, a method called adapters, which just adds a small number of new parameters throughout the model. Um, there's also prompt tuning, as we saw, that has been adapted to uh, multilingual um, adaptation as well. Um, so it's, in general, very exciting. Um, and uh, now with models like GPT-4, you can't really apply any of these strategies to adapt uh, the model because you have no access to, to fine tuning it. But hopefully, we, we see improvements on that front um, later on. So um, I don't want to go too much into the machine translation part here because Marjana already discussed a lot of it uh, in the last class. I do, however, want to go over one strategy that's very common for augmenting a data set in a different language. And it's useful not only for translation, but for many different tasks, like style transfer and paraphrasing and, and many generative tasks. So that's uh, called back translation. And many of you are actually using this in your final project. So I did want to give a brief overview of this. Um, so in back translation, your setting is that you might have a small parallel data set between two uh, languages or two styles or something like that, but it's too small to fine tune a giant language model on. And 
you want to augment your small parallel data set with a large automatically derived parallel data set. So the conditions are here are that you have a small parallel data set and you have a huge unlabeled monolingual data set in the target language. So let's say I have a very small English to French parallel data set. So these are English sentences with their French translations. Then I have a large number of French sentences for which I don't have any corresponding English translation. So the idea is how do I use this monolingual data to augment my small parallel data set? So the first thing I can do is train a model to go from French to English. So this is a translation model. It's trained on the small parallel data set. Or you could you know, just use uh, some large language model to do this for you with some prompting. Um, essentially, you need a way to get from the target to the source. Once you have this, you can then take your monolingual French data and translate it to the source language using this a method that you just developed. And so this component here is very noisy, right? It has, if you just train this from scratch, these translations are going to be very low quality. And when you are training a model on the union of both the, um, you know, the parallel data that you originally had that was made by humans, and this noisy alignment that you got from the back translation, you probably want to upweight the, uh, the good data more in your uh, training process than this noisy data. But this is a very reliable way of improving the quality of your outputs on your, say, machine translation or style transfer or similar kinds of tasks. Um, so here are some uh, examples using this for machine translation uh, for English to German. Let's say you just have your small parallel data set. You get a blue score of 20.4. But if you use back translation to get noisy augmented parallel uh, sentences and you train on that, you get 23.8 blue score. So you get a significant improvement when you uh, use back translation as a data augmentation. So it's use cases not just for machine translation, but for style transfer, transferring between two domains. So you might uh, want to do that. Um, any case where you're generating text, you have a small parallel data set. So this is common in like encoder decoder models where you have some input sentence and you have some output sequence that you want to generate. Um, and you're able to get a large amount of unlabeled data in whatever the target domain style or language is. So just a strategy that you should know about because it's very commonly used um, in the literature. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, honestly, I have never worked on um, domain transfer, so I'm not sure how exactly it works. But there's a lot of uh, work on attribute transfer, which I think is similar. Um, it's also kind of a bizarre task, but um, you know, you might have like a, um, I mean, there's even sentiment transfer, which I think is a similar example, where you have a positive review and you want to um, rewrite it to be a negative review, right? Similarly, you might have a review of a sports product that you might want to rewrite as a review of an electronic product. I mean, all of these are not really useful in the real world, but they might be useful as data augmentation techniques. So if, let's say you wanted to train a sentiment system on uh, reviews of electronic products. Um, maybe you could do some transfer from other domains to get more data. Um, in some cases, it may not make sense, right? Like if I'm referring to how uh, a basketball feels. It's not really clear how to transfer that to the electronics domain. Um, but in other cases, the review might be generic enough that I could do it. So um, yeah. All right. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll skip the, um, this uh, many-to-many -many translation thing. And I will um, talk more about the, the method that I discussed briefly at the beginning of a class called uh, LoRa. So this is basically an insight that we don't want to fine tune our entire model on uh, data from new languages. 
Instead, we might want to just add a small number of new parameters to adapt it to operate over new languages. Um, and so that is what we saw with this backtree in X model. It took this English only uh, language model, or you know, primarily English language model. I think Llama was pre-trained on some multilingual data as well. Uh, but the instructions that it was fine-tuned on were in only English. So um, it translated those to a bunch of different languages, and then it did not fine-tune the resulting model on that uh, newly created data set, um, like we have discussed throughout this class. So I think to explain the method that they actually used, Laura, it's helpful to look at what normal fine-tuning is and then reformulate it in a way that we can easily explain what the low-rank low update is doing. So in normal fine-tuning, right, I have my pre-trained model, right, that's um, given by this W here, but this is not just a weight matrix. It could be like, you know, all the weights associated with some giant language model. So I have some inputs and I get a representation uh, like some embedding that represents that um, input, or it could be a sequence of embeddings. And then I do something with the embedding, right? I could put a classifier over it, I could fine tune it to predict a new sequence or whatever. Um, regardless, I compute some loss over the labeled data set, and I do gradient descent, I do backprop, I come up with the uh, weight update, right? This delta W that I'm going to add or sorry, like subtract with the learning rate to um, get the new updated weight that is going to optimize my loss function, right? So this is the gradient descent that we talked about. And then I'm going to pass this input into my updated model and hopefully it gets a lower loss when I, when I do this with the updated weight. So this last step here, it assumes that we've already applied the uh, the gradient update to all the parameters, right? So to get W prime, I do W minus learning rate times delta W, right? So let's just take a look at uh, that in, in detail. So instead of just doing this update like here, so I get W prime, I could instead reformulate my updated forward paths to use the pre-trained weights and also incorporate these delta weights, the delta W, which is the gradient of W that I computed in this uh, middle uh, phase here. But instead, when I um, pass my input in, I could uh, feed it through the original pre-trained model. And I could also pass it through the, the delta weight and then add the contributions or perform the update after I get the resulting embeddings of both of these contributions. So basically it's just, um, you know, reformatting the, uh, the weight update so that you have two terms, the pre-trained weights and then the uh, gradient. So Laura is looking specifically at the uh, gradient of the uh, weight matrices in the model. And in particular, it relies on this observation that the weights and the gradient of the weights in these giant language models are generally low rank matrices. So what that means is, um, let's say I have a weight matrix that's 100 by 100, right? So I have some, oh, let's say WQ, the query matrix in layer three or something, is a 100 by 100 matrix um, for the sake of demonstration. So, if this was a full rank matrix, that would mean that every row column of this weight matrix uh, is, uh, it, it's not linearly dependent on any other rows or, or columns, right? So it's, uh, uh, there are no redundant rows in this, this weight matrix. But what people have found is that the actual rank of these matrices is quite low, which means that there are a lot of redundant, uh, redundancies in the weight matrices. Um, which means that you can actually express most of the information in them with a much smaller uh, weight matrix. So what um, the, uh, the creators of this method realized is that, well, if the gradients of these weights are low rank, then why do we have to store like this entire 100 by 100 gradient update during the fine-tuning process? Um, instead, 
why don't we just assume that the rank is low and it's set to some fixed small value here it's called r um, and we'll learn two weight matrices so let's say i have a hundred by hundred weight matrix w uh, what i can do is say i have two matrices w sub a which let's say is a hundred by two matrix and then w sub b which is a two by a hundred matrix so when I multiply A and B, I will get a 100 by 100 matrix, right? But the total number of parameters in both of these matrices is far lower than the 100 by 100 original matrix, right? So a 100 by 100 matrix has, what, 10,000 parameters? A um, 100 by 2 matrix has uh, 200 parameters, and a 2 by 100 matrix has 200 parameters. So I reduced the, um, the uh, storage cost from 1,000 parameter, sorry, 10,000 parameters to 400 parameters, if I assume that R is 2 here. So you can set R to like very low values and still get uh, really good uh, performance when you're fine tuning on a different task. Um, which is great because this dramatically reduces the memory footprint that is required to fine-tune one of these giant language models. So in the original paper, they only do the uh, updates for the attention weight matrices, so the query, key, value, uh, projections. They don't even do it for any of the feed-forward layers or anything else. So in some ways, this is similar to like prompt tuning where a large part of the model is being kept completely frozen. Um, and the fact that they are only learning these two weight matrices, W sub A and W sub B, means that actually in order to transmit the fine-tuned model parameters, you just need to send these delta weights, the low rank updates, um, to, to a person. You don't need to send the full model because the, the new model can be obtained by simply adding these delta weights to the uh, original pre-trained model parameters. So in some ways it's very similar to prompt tuning where um, in prompt tuning you can just send those uh, prepended embeddings to anyone and they can prepend it to their inputs, use the same frozen language model and get the performance that you got. So this is similar in that respect. Do you have a question? So are they Uh, from my understanding, this, this thing that they're decomposing is supposed to represent the gradient. Um, so they keep the weights frozen and they always add the pre-trained frozen weights to the uh, gradient update. But yeah. Then, so when you're training, like, to get those gradients, you still have to pass through the, the full weight matrix, right? Uh, when you're training, you like have to... Yeah, so you always have to have the, the full pre-trained model in your memory. Yeah, you just don't have to store the optimizer states for any of the frozen parameters. So if we were using like Adam or something, like we were using Google's SGP, then this wouldn't help that much, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess you, you wouldn't have to store the gradient matrices for those parameters, but so, but so your memory gain would be lower than with something like Adam, but it would still be a benefit. It would just not be, uh, yeah, as much. So this uh, table here shows uh, some of the impacts of this uh, LoRa method. Um, so here they experiment with GPT-3. So GPT-3 has 175 billion parameters, so it's a really big model. Um, they have three tasks here that they're fine-tuning on. Wiki, SQL, MNLI, and I'm not sure what this summarization task is. Um, but you see that uh, with LoRa, they have two configurations, just varying the rank, that R parameter of the update, um, to something small and something slightly larger. In both cases, the number of trainable parameters is far fewer than 175 billion, which is what it would be if you fine-tuned uh, GPT-3. And they show that they get basically the same performance as fine-tuning the full model, despite the fact that they've set their rank of these updates to something very low and they're freezing most of the parameters of the model. And this method seems roughly comparable to um, other kinds of parameter efficient fine-tuning approaches. Um, but 
you know, LoRa has some advantages that uh, similar to prompt tuning, you can just transmit the delta weights, which is what people have been doing recently with these open source models. So they assume you have the llama pre-trained model and they just uh, give you like this 4.7 million uh, delta weights that you can just add to the weight matrices and get the new fine-tuned model. So it's a pretty nice method that is becoming quite popular. Um, we saw one example here for um, multilingual uh, language model adaptation, um, but it was also used in the original Alpaca uh, paper as well to adapt to English. Um, so it's just basically a general purpose fine-tuning method that you can compare with uh, prompt tuning or with adapters. Okay, so any questions on um, anything? Yeah. Yeah, it does. So in uh, LoRa, actually you can see how they used it in the Bactrian X paper. Uh, yeah, so in the Hugging Face repository, um, you can see that their LoRa parameters, they set the rank to 64, and they only apply it to the query projection, key projection, value proje projection, and I think this is the output softmax layer. So um, uh, many of, most of the parameters of the model aren't even getting updated, right? Those are the big feed forward layers in the transformer. They're just being kept completely frozen. And this method also relies on you having the original pre-trained model weights. So uh, it's just learning like a, a delta on top of that pre-trained weights. Yeah. Yeah. So if people notice that the gradient updates are low rank, then like have anyone tried to experiment training a model from scratch by just decomposing all of the weight matrices and then only training on the and only updating the yeah, so I am not familiar with anyone who's done this with very large language models, but people definitely did this before the advent of things like BERT, uh, where um, they would, uh, yeah, I mean, people have used these low rank approximations in, in neural networks before to approximate much bigger models. Um, I am sure there are many challenges associated with training from scratch using these versus Fine tuning. Um, yeah. I mean, it, it could be that um, the the low rank behavior only exists in the fine tuning regime and not from from scratch. I I'm not sure. Maybe people have tried this and it never worked, which is why we haven't seen it. But yeah, it's a good uh, good experiment to run. I think. Other questions? Let's see on YouTube. All right. So. Uh, Next time, we'll be talking about some of the uh, ethical issues with large language models. So it's a slightly different um, type of lecture than, than before, but there are certainly numerous ethical issues, especially with the newer models that we're, uh, we've been discussing um, for the last half of the semester. So yeah, I'll see you then. Yeah.